The Xbox series of consoles has gone through a number of changes regarding the look and feel both as a brand and as a user interface experience. And when we look at the general dashboards that we've gotten to see over the years, it almost seems as if the Xbox went from this Mountain Dew powered science fiction gaming machine to a more minimalistic, all-in-one, sleek design. And with that being said, we thought it'd be interesting to take a newer look back, considering there's a new line of Xboxes in the Xbox Series X and S. And we we can go back to the very beginning, looking at all of the dashboards from the very start with the introduction of the original Xbox all the way to where we are today. First, we wanted to go all the way back to 2001 with the original Xbox dashboard. This dashboard had these iconic green hues and it had a pretty basic navigation system with things like game save management, music, and overall pretty general settings. But of course, it had this really cool science fiction theme associated with it. It had these cool sound effects that built into its ambient noise and it just had this out of this world feel with the green colors and sound effects tied together. Like, I said, it felt like a console that was genuinely powered off of Mountain Dew, and that was the appeal of it back in the day. That was something really cool about it. It had that original loading screen startup visual and sound effect that just got you hyped up for starting up the console, even if you didn't know what you were going to play yet. I mean, look at this. And there was this really interesting Easter egg where if you were idle for a certain amount of time, you could hear these whispers, which were actually recordings from the Apollo missions. The first time we heard this, it was probably really terrifying, but also a really cool thing. And knowing about it nowadays, it's a cool little thing that they had hid in the dashboard. <laughs> Now, when we look at the dashboard itself and the user interface, it didn't really change all that much through the life of the original Xbox, where changes would be commonplace in later iterations of the consoles. We did see an addition of an Xbox Live tab once the service launched in 2002, which was about a year after the initial launch, which gave you an overview of your online friends and voice chat. And while these functions were really cool, Halo 2 was probably more popular in managing friends and talking with your friends, as you could talk to an entire party at once. You weren't limited to just one person like you would be through the Xbox Live part of it, but still people would bounce back and forth between what functions they used, whether it was the Xbox dashboard side of things or Halo 2's interface. And while looking at the dashboard compared to today, it might look like it's pretty basic and bare bones, but it had the basic functionality you needed back then and it looked cool. It still has a special place in our hearts and memories all these years later. And I think that holds true for anyone who played on the original Xbox back in the early to mid 2000s. But moving forward, we're going to jump all the way up to 2005 with the very beginning of the Xbox 360. And the Xbox 360, unlike the original Xbox, went through a ton of changes over the years. But the initial launch of the 360 had what the community refers to typically as the Xbox 360 blades. First of all, when you booted up your Xbox, you had this cool 3D rendered sphere with an X in it, which was kind of cool, and they would change this later on, but at the beginning, this is what it looked like. And then, boom, you were looking at this dashboard. Essentially, the 360, in its earliest release phase, had this really interesting setup where everything was divided into pages, or kind of like a folder system. We had four tabs, the Xbox Live tab, Games tab, a Media tab, a System tab, and not too long after its launch, they did add a Marketplace tab, and from there, you're able to go left and right and navigate based on what section or category you wanted to access. It was pretty simplistic, but also intuitive at the same time. At the time of its launch, it was really straightforward and it really aligned with what the Xbox 360 was trying to be as a brand. And it kind of still had that gamer fuel vibe from the original Xbox days, but it was much more refined and professional. And it was in this easier to read and easier to navigate form. Now, it might not have been the most pleasing to look at, at first glance, but it really did get the job done. And if we fast forward three years into the Xbox 360's life, we can see they did a lot of massive overhaul changes when it came to the Xbox 360's dashboard interface. A few years into the 360's life though, they did a pretty massive overhaul to the way that the 360's user interface and dashboard worked. Players who had an Xbox 360 back in the day probably remember playing this if you're in the middle years of the 360's life. And while a huge 
large majority of players back in the day were fans of that simple Xbox 360 blade design, this update decided to switch things up into a more column or row based system. They titled this the Xbox NXE Update, which stood for the new Xbox experience. And people were kind of excited about it. And of course, once the update was implemented, a lot of people kind of had some mixed opinions as well. This design philosophy kind of took a lot of the features and options that you would normally click through or switch to the blades and attempted to center all of the features into one area so there was less overall screens you had to flip between. This was likely intended so if you were new to the console, you'd be able to find whatever you were looking for, where with the original blade design, sometimes you had to look for whatever feature you wanted for a little while and it made it a little bit harder. Also in general, it looked like Xbox was wanting to maybe tap into a little bit of a younger audience as well, wanting to compete with the likes of Nintendo that was crushing it with the Nintendo Wii, because shortly after this update, they also introduced their own avatars, which was something that Nintendo had done with their Miis, and probably updating the user interface to be a little bit easier to navigate could help players of all ages figure out what they're trying to do. The avatars were a really cool addition back in the day. They were kind of fun and goofy at the same time. You could customize them and even buy little things off the Xbox store for your character, and that was kind of cool, especially because your avatars were actually used as in-game characters in certain types of games, like Doritos Crash Course or Castle Miner Z. Okay, nowadays, the Xbox avatars look absolutely terrifying. I don't know why we can't just go back to these good old looking avatars, but uh, whatever. But still, this dashboard was cool. You could put in your own themes that you could get off of the store, and it just was really appealing to the eyes when you were in game and you opened up that quick dashboard menu. You can quickly check your messages and your party just right there. In 2011, though, in an attempt to kind of streamline matters even more, Microsoft released the 2011 Metro update, which is kind of the last major UI update we would see on the Xbox 360, though they did do a couple of things later on still. But this update actually ended up being the longest lasting dashboard to date, mostly because this version is still kind of the version that's used on the 360 nowadays, or at least the newer updates are based off of this original 2011 version. But this new updated design tried to bridge the gap between the differences that were obviously present between the first two updates to the dashboard and added functionality like having everything more centered, but also reintroduced the pages kind of similar to how the blades were originally. But then they also kind of mixed in elements and aesthetic design choices from Windows 8, which was something Microsoft was trying to make their whole brand uniform in that sense. You know, Bing had just come out. It was a weird time for Microsoft. And this design was actually pretty unfavorable. I mean, it looked nice at the time just to have something fresh and new, but a lot of people really didn't especially care for the design. There wasn't really any new features that made you excited to have this redesign. And they also took away some of the other things like the darker color scheme. And when you're navigating through the quick dashboard, they replaced it with this really bright design that really wasn't easy on the eyes. It was also a little bit clunky. It felt like every time you would pick an option, sometimes it would have to load a split second longer, which felt unnecessary considering those weren't problems beforehand. But yeah, a lot of people really missed the older design just previous. I was definitely a fan of the darker design and I didn't really like the cleaner new design that also felt a little bit laggier. I still feel like this was kind of a poor design choice here. They did also overhaul the intro sequence, which was something not a lot of people expected, going from that 3D orb to something a little bit more upbeat and in time for 2011. This visual update also coincided with two new features that Xbox was introducing, cloud saves, which was a really nice and convenient way to store your game saves, and beacons, something that literally no one used. But this should have been a pretty big indicator of what Xbox as a brand was aiming to do in the future. This new redesign really focused more heavily on the media side of the Xbox 360 and less about the gamer side of the 360. And this update actually ended up killing some really cool things. Like prior to this update, you could watch Netflix with your friends in this little like movie theater thing with your avatars all there and it would sync up your Netflix streams at the same time. This is also during the time where they really started pushing the fact that you could rent movies on the console and they started adding advertisements to the dashboard for the first time ever. <laughs> you could spend like a couple hundred dollars on your console and then all of a sudden have an advertisement for something completely 
completely random or unrelated like pizza or an insurance company. It was a little bit jarring back then. Nowadays we're used to seeing advertisements tied into marketplaces and whatnot, but back then, coming from a time when that would never been seen before, it was definitely extra jarring. Fortunately enough, the newer user interfaces we would get over the years would be a little bit better because at least the advertisements are relevant to gamers and not just some random advertisement, but it still was weird. They also made it such a huge deal that Bing was now available on the Xbox 360, and no one used Bing then, and no one uses Bing now. Also, the Xbox 360 was a big deal because it did introduce a party chat for the first time, so you could talk to up to eight friends at a time, as long as you had Xbox Live Gold. If you only had Xbox Live Silver, which was the free version, you could private chat with one other person, but you couldn't talk in parties. And also, it is worth noting, towards the end of the Xbox 360's life, they did finally phase out those advertisements on the dashboard in 2020. But for the most part, that was more or less it for the rest of the Xbox 360's main dashboard. Moving forward into 2013, when the Xbox One originally released, it was absolutely god-awful. It added this new Snap system, kind of like what Windows had for a while, that let you run apps side by side, allowing you to play your game and maybe watch a movie at the same time, or switch between the two. And when it worked, it rarely worked, it was pretty okay, but a lot of the time it would just fall apart and not work and it was just really an awful experience with a lot of apps constantly crashing. There were some cool things I, theoretically when the Xbox One first released, like there was less unused UI space on the Xbox which was kind of nice and while on paper it sounded like a good user interface design, it just didn't really work the way that you wanted to. The whole running apps in snap mode side by side slowed down the whole system and a lot of the time the UI felt very unresponsive and really clunky to use. Remember, this also was supposed to have the Kinect as a required part of the system, and it was supposed to be this huge integration that was hand in hand with the user interface experience. At launch, you couldn't buy an Xbox One unless it came with a Kinect, so they were expecting you to really lean into that. Just the Xbox One didn't sell well, nobody wanted to use the Kinect, so they eventually phased the Kinect out. The new startup sequence was a lot simpler, just this Xbox logo. A lot of people were stuck on that logo for a really long time when their console wasn't starting up properly. I actually got an Xbox One day one, and I remember trying to play with a friend on Battlefield 4, and the party system just wasn't working. A lot of the times this party would crash or you just couldn't hear your friends talking for whatever reason. This whole thing was a mess. Fortunately enough though, Xbox One did have this dashboard phased out relatively quickly. It's actually the shortest lasting UI design in all of Xbox history and it got replaced in just a little bit over a year when they launched the new Xbox One experience and they announced they would be reworking the Xbox dashboard to fit a little bit better with the launch of Windows 10. I guess they could start to shed off some of the water weight from Windows 8's uniform design that Microsoft was trying to implement everywhere. This was a time where Xbox was really refocusing more on the fact that Xbox is supposed to be a gaming console first and a media device second, which they'd kind of missed the mark for the past couple of years. Finally, they started to phase out things like the tile design, which Windows was known for, and they focused on responsiveness and speed. While at the same time, Microsoft also shifted away from the Kinect altogether and focused more on the core elements of the dashboard that would make it easier to use for new people. They arranged the menu buttons in a new way and also made it easier to open up a side menu rather than taking you out of the game just so you could click on whatever little thing you were trying to click on in the process. This new little side menu actually acted a lot similarly to the way that the old Quick Dashboard from the Xbox 360 did and it just made the whole user interface a lot smoother. There was still some things that they needed to fix and it wasn't perfect but it was definitely leaps in the right direction compared to what they had at launch. And then when 2017 rolled around they rolled out a newer Xbox One UI which evolved on the groundwork from that big 2015 update and to this day is still kind of the base that led into what we have today on the newer consoles. And then towards the end of 2020 in order to get prepared for the upcoming release of the Xbox Series X and Series S which would run mostly the same software as the Xbox One family of consoles, there was a pretty big update that just changed a few things in the UI sense. Certain features were
were rearranged, there were new icons added in, a new marketplace had been updated where the store looked completely different, there were new options added in like the ability to suspend active games and prioritize download speeds. After the full release of the Xbox Series S and Series X, which once again updated that boot up screen to this bad boy, Microsoft began adding more accessibility updates and also introduced integration for the Xbox Cloud Gaming support, which would allow you to stream games without necessarily having to have them installed on your console. And most recently, they added in the ability to reveal what secret achievements are instead of them just being hidden and then you have to look them up online. Now you can just see what they are, which is kind of cool. It is really interesting looking at the current user interface for Xbox where it's just so much tighter and cleaner and just more fluid than what it was all the way back when the Xbox One first launched and it was just a mess. And while that's where we are today for the consoles, Xbox has always had a presence on other platforms beyond just the Xbox consoles itself. And the user interfaces over there and the dashboards that were used on these other platforms have been incredibly interesting. For instance, PC gaming has always, to some extent, had some connection to Xbox and Microsoft, going all the way back to the original Windows Live days. You might remember when Microsoft was rolling out the at live.com email addresses, and there was Xbox Live Gold, there was games for Windows Live, MSN Instant Messenger got turned into Windows Live Messenger, and the earliest days of Windows Live games tying directly into the Xbox services was the use of a gamer tag, and that was probably the main reason people would link up and share their details from one platform like Xbox to another. If you had Xbox Live and, say, a Zune, you could connect your gamer tag on there for whatever reason. Back in 2007, if you had Halo 2 Vista, you could log on with games for Windows Live and get achievements in Halo 2, which was something that the original Halo 2 did not have, as the original Xbox didn't have achievements, but Halo 2 on Windows Vista in 2007 did actually have achievements that you could count towards your gamer score. Now, the user interface for games for Windows Live did change quite a bit in the earliest days and shifted a bit, always trying to keep up with what Xbox was doing, but never never quite was able to have any of the functionality that people really wanted. Eventually, you could get messages with text and voice messages, you could get your friends list to show up your recent players, but that was about it. There wasn't really crossplay in too many situations, just a few games here and there. I do remember if you had Windows Live Messenger, you could also send messages through this quicker, quick message thing to players on the Xbox 360. Barely anyone ever used it, but one time my friend messaged me on that and I had no idea what was going on. This whole system ended up being pretty clunky and unpopular and would eventually be phased out by the end of the Xbox 360's life, where it was very obvious that Microsoft was having plans for revamping just the whole way that interactivity on the Xbox and the computer would look, especially with Microsoft's whole uniform design approach. For the most part, the games for Windows Live would be replaced with the Microsoft Store and the shortly lived Windows Phone. I think at this point, just random things started coming out of Microsoft just to see what would stick because if you're a PC, Xbox, or a PC player who regularly tries to access their Xbox gamer tag and account and all of that, a couple of years ago it was really, really confusing, but slowly things have gotten better over time. With Microsoft finally moving away from games for Windows Live, they started trying a bunch of other things. Firstly, starting out with the Xbox 360 Smart Glass, which was originally announced at E3 2012 for Windows 8, Android, and iOS, which would allow you to connect to your account from Xbox through whatever device you were using. This was weird, they didn't really know what they wanted to do with the app. In some cases, it would serve as an extra screen, like if you needed a mini map right there on your phone, and in other cases, it would have like weird facts about television shows or movies that you could look at or something. Honestly, I just remember the biggest plus about this back in the day was it was a new way to check my Xbox messages if I wasn't on my Xbox and I needed to send a friend a message or something real quick. It was really cool to have that accessibility. But outside of that, there wasn't really too much of a purpose there. They would do an update in November 2013 to coincide with the release of the Xbox One, which would give more features for Android, iOS, Windows 8.1, and of course the Windows Phone. It added in a couple of new things, like for instance, functionality for controlling the console in some cases. And as time progressed, we did start to see the Xbox Smart Glass and whatever it would end up evolving into be pretty usable on mobile phones and actually have some pretty nice features. 
features. The PC version has had a little bit of a rougher process, which is equally interesting, but a little more frustrating from an actual usability standpoint. Windows 10 was a big point for PC players as it introduced a revamped version of Smart Glass, which was now simply just called Xbox. So all of a sudden, if you were on the PC, you could just have an Xbox program installed, which was a little confusing, but at least it added in a library for your PC games, and you had the ability to stream your games from your Xbox One to your PC using local network, which is something I actually used back in the earlier days of Rocket Sloth because Halo wasn't on PC yet, and that was like the closest experience I could get to it. It actually wasn't that bad of a feature. In 2016, they would update the mobile versions of the Xbox One Smart Glass app, also renamed to just Xbox as well. And unfortunately, the 360 Smart Glass was not updated for quite some time and officially was discontinued in 2018. Slowly during this time also, Xbox was dipping their toes into some crossplay stuff when they did PC releases, like with games like Sea of Thieves. Minecraft had had crossplay for quite a while, so the importance of being able to access your account in more ways than just on a single console was actually being useful here with these extra additions of apps. 2019's where things started to get a little bit confusing, as Microsoft started adding extra features to the PC, maybe an overwhelming amount, which made things more confusing possibly, and the way that they sometimes would just drop off type of support in favor of something else without really signifying that something was being sunsetted could be really confusing as well. For instance, in 2019, Microsoft revamped the Xbox Game Bar feature for Windows 10, which gives you some of the features that the Xbox app had, but also is a separate entity all in itself. And then to make things more confusing, you know how there was an Xbox app that was originally Smart Glass? Well, they ended up launching a brand new app with a redesigned interface that connects much better to Xbox's family of user interfaces, but by calling that the Xbox app, it caused confusion because the other program was called the Xbox app, which they then went and retroactively renamed to the Xbox Console Companion. So despite the fact that the Xbox Console Companion was called the Xbox app up until they released the new Xbox app, the Xbox Console Companion was that original smart glass concept, and then they also don't update the Xbox Console Companion despite the fact that they had renamed it at that same conference. It sounds really confusing, but it would be like if in 2013, Microsoft announced that they were releasing a brand new Xbox 360 that is better in every way and is going to be the main thing that they're going to support for the future. However, you still can play on your Xbox Ultra, but then nobody would know what the Xbox Ultra was, but really, Microsoft secretly renamed the 360 to the Xbox Ultra? Just my hypothetical situation is equally as confusing. But you get the idea. Renaming something that everyone already used and replacing it with something else that has the same name and then retroactively changing the original name is really a confusing move and then all of a sudden there's like three different Xbox programs that you can have running simultaneously on Windows and you don't know which one actually has the features you need it to and which ones are just discontinued. Nonetheless, having Xbox support on the PC is a lot better than it once was. Being able to join party chats from your PC or from your mobile device has been really cool and the newer usability of using things like Xbox remote play where you can play your console from whatever device you're on and cloud gaming which allows you to access pretty much an Xbox through the cloud anywhere is also a really awesome addition as well. Over the years we've seen some crazy things when it comes to how the Xbox dashboard has evolved going from this to this but ultimately at the end of the day it is really awesome that we could look back over all these years and some of us still have the same accounts we've been playing on since we were kids and it's because of the fact that Xbox has continued to support this this live moniker over the years and it continues to live on to this day. At the end of the day though, which was your favorite iteration of the Xbox dashboard? My personal favorite is still that good old 2009 era Xbox 360 dashboard, the one right after the blades, even though the blades were pretty awesome, but the one that had that dark quick dashboard was just really cool to have as a feature, and I think I just have a soft spot for that one. Let us know your thoughts down below. If you like these types of videos on the glory days of Xbox Live and those type of videos from back in the day, check out our channel. We have a lot of really cool Halo stuff, but other things as well that you might really like. But otherwise, that's it for today. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you all next time with a brand new video.